Today's quiet and somber liturgy begins with Cardinal Sean and the other ministers kneeling and prostrating themselves here in the sanctuary of the cathedral to recall that hour when Jesus handed over his spirit to his Father. Join us now in this solemn moment of prayer. The Liturgy of Good Friday is the most somber of the entire church year, restrained, straightforward. The altar is bare, no cloth, no candles, cross. There is no mass, according to the church's ancient tradition. The sacraments are not celebrated today or tomorrow. The cardinal begins now with the opening prayer. Remember your mercies, O Lord, and with your eternal protection sanctify your servants for whom Christ, your Son, by the shedding of his blood, established the paschal mystery, and who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. We turn our attention now to God's holy word, the first reading drawn from the book of the prophet Isaiah. The mystery of the glorious cross is immediately placed before us. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be raised high and greatly exalted. Even as many were amazed at him, so marred was his look beyond human semblance and his appearance beyond that of the sons of man so shall he startle many nations. Because of him, kings shall stand speechless. For those who have not been told shall see. Those who have not heard shall ponder it. Who would believe what we have heard? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up like a sapling before him, like a shoot from the parched earth. There was in him no stately bearing to make us look at him, nor appearance that would attract us to him. He was spurned and avoided by people, a man of suffering, accustomed to infirmity, one of those from whom people hide their faces, spurned and we held him in no esteem. Yet, it was our infirmities that he bore, our sufferings that he endured, while we thought of him as stricken, as one smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our offenses, crushed for our sins, Upon him was the chastisement that makes us whole. By his stripes, we were healed. We had all gone astray like sheep, each following his own way. 
but the Lord laid upon him the guilt of us all. Though he was harshly treated, he submitted and opened not his mouth. Like a lamb led to the slaughter or a sheep before the shearers, he was silent and opened not his mouth. Oppressed and condemned, he was taken away. And who would have thought any more of his destiny? When he was cut off from the land of the living and smitten for the sin of his people, a grave was assigned him among the wicked and a burial place with evildoers, though he had done no wrong nor spoken any falsehood. But the Lord was pleased to crush him in infirmity. If he gives his life as an offering for sin, he shall see his descendants in a long life, and the will of the Lord shall be accomplished through him. Because of his affliction, he shall see light in the fullness of days. Through his suffering, my servant shall justify many, and their guilt he shall bear. Therefore, I will give him his portion among the great, and he shall divide the spoils with the mighty, because he surrendered himself to death and was counted among the wicked. And he shall take away the sins of many and win pardon for their offenses. The word of the Lord. The response to the reading from the prophet Isaiah is Psalm 31. And our refrain, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. become like a broken vessel. from the 
hands of my enemies and of those who pursue me. The second reading this afternoon is drawn from the epistle to the Hebrews. We hear of Jesus, son of the eternal father, our great high priest. The cross perfected Jesus. This is at the heart of the Christian mystery. A reading from the letter of the Hebrews. Brothers and sisters, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confessions, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has similarly been tested in every way, yet without sin. So let us confidently approach the throne of grace to receive mercy and to find grace for timely help. In the days when Christ was in the flesh, he offered prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And when he was made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. The word of the Lord. We prepare now to listen to the Passion of our Lord Jesus Christ. On Good Friday, the Passion is always drawn from John's Gospel, unlike on Palm Sunday, from the Synoptic Gospels this year, if you might recall, from the Gospel according to Matthew. In John's Gospel, Jesus' power and majesty shine through. Jesus is in control. He carries his cross alone. He is victorious on the cross. He reigns from the tree. The cross is our glory. The instrument of death is the instrument of salvation. Today, the passion of our Lord Jesus Christ from the Gospel of John is chanted As we listen, we enter into the mystery that we celebrate on this Good Friday. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ, King of endless glory. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ, King of endless glory. Christ became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Because of this, God greatly exalted him 
and bestowed on him the name which is above every name. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ, King of endless glory. The Passion of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Jesus went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley. There was a garden there, and he and his disciples entered it. The place was familiar to Judas as well, the one who was to hand him over, because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. Judas took the court, as well as God supplied by the chief priests and the Pharisees, and came there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. Jesus, aware of all that would happen to him, stepped forward and said to them, who is it you want? They replied. He answered. I am he. Now Judas, the one who was to hand him over, was right there with them. As Jesus said to them, I am he. They retreated slightly and fell to the ground. Jesus put the question to them again. Who is it you want? They repeated. Jesus the Nazarene. Jesus said. I have told you, I am he. If I am the one you want, let these men go. This was to fulfill what he had said. I have not lost one of those you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the slave of the high priest, severing his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. At that, Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword back in its sheath. Am I not to drink the cup the Father has given me? Then the soldiers of the cohort, their tribune, and the Jewish guards arrested Jesus and bound him. They led him first to Annas, the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had proposed to the Jews the advantage of having one man die for the people. Simon Peter, in company with another disciple, kept following Jesus closely. This disciple, who was known to the high priest, stayed with Jesus as far as the high priest's courtyard, while Peter was left standing at the gate. The disciple known to the high priest came out and spoke to the woman at the gate, and then brought Peter in. This servant girl who kept the gate said to Peter, Aren't you one of this man's followers? He replied, No, not I. 
Now the night was cold, and the servants and the guards who were standing around had made a charcoal fire to warm themselves by. Peter joined them and stood there warming himself. The high priest questioned Jesus, first about his disciples, then about his teaching. Jesus answered by saying, I have spoken publicly to anyone who would listen. I always taught in a synagogue or in the temple area where all the Jews come together. There was nothing secret about anything I said. Why do you question me? Question those who heard me when I spoke. It should be obvious they will know what I said. At this reply, one of the guards who was standing nearby gave Jesus a sharp blow on the face. He said, Is that any way to answer the high priest? Jesus replied, If I said anything wrong, produce the evidence. But if I spoke the truth, why hit me? Annas next sent him bound to the high priest Caiaphas. All through this, Simon Peter had been standing there warming himself. They said to him, Are you not a disciple of me? He denied it, saying, I am not. One of the high priest's slaves, as it happened, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had severed, insisted, But did I not see you with him in the garden? Peter denied it again. At that moment, a cock began to crow. At daybreak, they brought Jesus from Caiaphas to the Praetorium. They did not enter the Praetorium themselves, for they had to avoid ritual impurity if they were to eat the Passover supper. Pilate came out to them. He demanded, What accusation do you bring against this man? They retorted, If he were not a criminal, he would certainly not have handed him over to you. At this, Pilate said, why do you not take him and pass judgment on him according to your law? The Jews answered, We may not put anyone to death. This was to fulfill what Jesus said, indicating the sort of death he would die. Pilate went back into the praetorium and summoned Jesus. He asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Are you saying this on your own, or have others been telling you about me? Pilate retorted, I am no Jew. It is your own people and the chief priests who have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom does not belong to this world. If my kingdom were of this world, 
my subjects would be fighting to save me from being handed over to the Jews. As it is, my kingdom is not here. At this, Pilate said to him, So then, you are a king, Jesus replied. It is you who say I am a king. The reason why I was born, the reason why I came into the world, is to testify to the truth. Anyone committed to the truth hears my voice. Pilate said to him, Truth, what does that mean? After this remark, Pilate went out again to the Jews and told them, Speaking for myself, I find no case against this man. Recall your custom, whereby I release to you someone at Passover time. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They shouted back, We want Barabbas, not this one. Barabbas was an insurrectionist. Pilate's next move was to take Jesus and have him scourged. The soldiers then wove a crown of thorns and fixed it on his head, throwing around his shoulders a cloak of royal purple. Repeatedly they came up to him and said, slapping his face as they did so, For him, King of the Jews. Pilate went out a second time and said to the crowd, Observe what I do. I am going to bring him out to you to make you realize that I find no case against him. When Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple cloak, Pilate said to them, Look at the man. As soon as the chief priests and the temple guards saw him, they shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said, Take him and crucify him yourselves. I find no case against him. The Jews responded, We have a and according to the law, he was done, because he made himself God's son. When Pilate heard this kind of talk, he was more afraid than ever. Going back into the praetorium, he said to Jesus, Where do you come from? Jesus would not give him any answer. Pilate asked him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have the power to release you and the power to crucify you? Jesus answered, you would have no power over me whatever unless it were given you from above. That is why he who handed me over to you is guilty of the greater sin. After this, Pilate was eager to release him, but the Jew shouted, if you free this man, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who makes himself a king becomes Caesar's rival. 
Pilate heard what they were saying, then brought Jesus outside and took a seat on a judge's bench at the place called the Stone Pavement, Gabbatha in Hebrew. It was the preparation day for Passover, and the hour was about noon. He said to the Jews, Look at your king. At this they shouted, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate exclaimed, What? Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest replied, We have no king but Caesar. In the end, Pilate handed over Jesus to be crucified. Jesus was led away, and carrying the cross by himself, went out to what is called the place of the skull, in Hebrew, Golgotha. There they crucified him, and two others with him, one on either side, Jesus in the middle. Pilate had an inscription placed on the cross which read, Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. This inscription in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek was read by many of the Jews since the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. The chief priests of the Jews tried to tell Pilate, You should not have written, O king of the Jews, write instead, this man claimed to be king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. After the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them four ways, one for each soldier. There was also his tunic, but this tunic was woven in one piece from top to bottom and had no seam. They said to each other, We should insert it. Let's throw dice to see who gets it. The purpose of this was to have the scripture fulfilled. They divided my garments among them. For my clothing they cast lots. And this was what the soldiers did. Near the cross of Jesus, there stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. Seeing his mother there with the disciple whom he loved, Jesus said to his mother, Woman, there is your son. In turn, he said to the disciple, There is your mother. From that hour onward, the disciple took her into his care. After that, Jesus Realizing that everything was now finished, to bring the scripture to fulfillment, said, I am thirsty. There was a jar there full of common wine. They stuck a sponge soaked in this wine on some hyssop, and raised it to his lips. When Jesus took the wine, he said, Now it is finished. Then he bowed his head and delivered over 
His Spirit. Since it was the preparation day, the Jews did not want to have the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a solemn feast day. They asked Pilate that the legs be broken and the bodies be taken away. Accordingly, the soldiers came and broke the legs of the men crucified with Jesus, first of one, then of the other. When they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. One of the soldiers ran a lance into his side, and immediately blood and water flowed out. This testimony has been given by an eyewitness, and his testimony is true. He tells what he knows is true, so that you may believe. These events took place for the fulfillment of Scripture, break none of his bones. There is still another scripture passage which says, They shall look on him whom they have pierced. Afterward, Joseph of Arimathea, a disciple of Jesus, although a secret one for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate's permission to remove Jesus' body. Pilate granted it, so they came and took the body away. Nicodemus, the man who had first come to Jesus at night, likewise came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, which weighed about a hundred pounds. They took Jesus' body, and in accordance with Jewish burial custom, bound it up in wrappings of cloth with perfumed oils. In the place where he had been crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. Because of the Jewish preparation day, they laid Jesus there, for the tomb was close at hand. The Gospel of the Lord. So ends the Passion of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. This Cathedral Church of the Archdiocese of Boston is dedicated to the Holy Cross, which we venerate this day. Cardinal Sean now preaches in his own cathedral church, a glorious building decorated in tribute to that wood on which Jesus hung. Even the very crucifix we will venerate this afternoon holds a precious relic of the true cross. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, we gather today on Good Friday in this, the Cathedral of the Holy Cross, 
Here the beautiful stained glass windows remind us of the finding of the Holy Cross by St. Helena. And on the other side we have the beautiful window depicting the Emperor Heraclitus taking the Holy Cross into Jerusalem after it's been rescued from the Saracens. Today, having listened to this magnificent passion of St. John, I'd like to pull out a few threads from this magnificent tapestry. The passion begins with Jesus walking from the Cenacle, the place of the Last Supper, to the Garden of Gethsemane. It was the time of the Passover, and in the temple they would have slain many thousands of lambs for the people of the city of Jerusalem for their Seder meals. And the blood was poured into the creek that went down to Kedron. So as Jesus walked along that path to the Garden of Gethsemane, he would have seen the water turned red by the blood of the lambs. Jesus is our Lamb of God. At the Paschal Lamb, Jesus is the one whose blood has saved us from sin and death. He arrives then at the Garden of Gethsemane to begin his, his passion. It's the first sorrowful mystery of the rosary. And indeed, the Lord's passion begins right there with the psychological suffering the sense of betrayal, of abandonment. And it's here that Jesus says yes to the will of the Father. Father, if this chalice can pass from me, let it pass, but not my will, but thine be done. So the crucifixion begins here. It's in the garden that Jesus is arrested. In Dublin, they have that beautiful painting of Caravaggio that depicts the arresting of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. And there in that painting, you see the cohort of soldiers, and even according to the Scriptures, there were so many that they sent to arrest Jesus, a huge contingent. In the midst of all of that, Peter takes out a sword in a very foolhardy gesture, and lops off the ear of Malchus. In a bullfight, when the torero is very brave, they give him the ears of the bull after the fight. But Peter's courage evaporated very quickly when he saw how many people had come to arrest Jesus. Luke tells us that Jesus healed Malchus's ear, his last miracle before the crucifixion. Imagine Malchus, what it was like to, first of all, have your ear chopped off and then suddenly to have it restored. Peter is such an extraordinary figure in the gospel. We see the bravura, the desire to do what's right and also his humanity. He tries to stay with Jesus. He tries to defend him, but then he ends up running off into the night. However, the gospel describes for us how Peter wants to follow Jesus at a safe distance. He wants to see what's going to happen to him, to see if there's any way that perhaps he could help. Peter is recognized because of his accent. I always say, when you're a Bostonian, people can immediately know you by your accent. Well, Peter was a Galilean, and people could identify him very quickly as being from that part of the Holy Land that Jesus came from. The first time, he denies Jesus not to a soldier with a long knife, but to a waitress with an attitude. Later on, he's identified by a horror, a horror, a relative of Malchus, a relative of the one whose ear he cut off. He said, didn't I see you in the garden? Probably thinking, yes, with the, with the machete. Peter 
denies that he is a disciple. And at that moment, the rooster crows, and Peter realizes what he has done. The Gospels say that Peter whipped, wept better, bitterly. I wonder if perhaps this pandemic isn't like a rooster crow for us, a call to conversion, a call to, con to reflect on our lives and our values. We see how this pandemic is unmasking many of the injustices in our society, how the poor don't have enough medical help, and we see how sometimes people are competing with each other rather than helping each other. The poor and the elderly are the most vulnerable. The pandemic for all of us can be a time to reflect on what is really important and how we can live out our humanity and be a family and help one another. That the important things in life are not wealth or fame or comfort or pleasure. The important things are family, friends, health, peace, a job. As we read on in the gospel, if, if Peter had little courage, he had more than the other disciples, at least he was following at a safe distance, Pilate shows even less courage. He knew that Jesus was innocent. He'd been born by his wife. He didn't pay any attention to her. But he thought, well, if I give the people the choice between Jesus and Barabbas, certainly they'll take Jesus. And he chose Barabbas because I'm sure he was the most repulsive, ugly, terrible person. And yet, over, Barabbas, over Jesus, the crowd called for Barabbas to be set free and Jesus to be crucified. Pilate washes his hands. It wasn't for fear of the coronavirus that he was doing it, but he was doing it to free himself of the responsibility of Jesus' life. The gospel describes how Jesus is accompanied by a group of his disciples on Calvary. We have Mary, Mary of Clopas, Mary Magdalene, the young John the Apostle. I wonder what John was thinking as he stood there looking at Jesus and the two crosses on either side. It was John's mother who went to Jesus and said, I want my sons to have the two thrones at your right and your left. Well, those two thrones were two crosses, and now they were occupied by thieves. We know too from our own experience that oftentimes it's worse to see someone you love suffering than suffering yourself. So we can only imagine how much Mary and the disciples were suffering when they saw Jesus being crucified. In the mission church here in Boston, the main statue over the altar is a statue of our Blessed Mother holding the crown of thorns. What a powerful image that is. I thought of that image many years ago when I was coming back from a pilgrimage in Lourdes and we stopped in Paris and it just happened to be the day when the crown of thorns was brought out in the Cathedral of Notre Dame for public veneration. And so we, we rushed to the cathedral, and the cathedral was packed with Roman Catholics and Orthodox, uh, people coming to, to venerate this most important relic uh, of the, the crown of thorns. And I was sitting in, in one of the pews, and uh, Father Jonathan said, oh, there's a cardinal here. So they rushed out, took me into the sacristy, and handed me the crown of thorns to carry out for the people to venerate. 
I was so moved. I thought this is the crown of thorns that Mary held in her hands when she was on Calvary. And we can just imagine Mary receiving Christ's body in her arms. Any mother, the first thing she's going to do is yank that crown of thorns off of her child's head to stop the pain, to stop the humiliation. Mary was a pillar of faith and of strength on Calvary. When I was a young friar, I was in Rome for one of our meetings of the Order. Someone invited me to a, a movie. I had, it's the only time I've ever gone to a movie in Rome. The superior gave me permission. But when I came home, the older friars were very upset with me. And they were all scolding me. They said, oh, this is the bruta figura. A friar shouldn't be going to the movie. And, but they were very curious. They said, well, what did you see? I said, well, I went to see the gospel according to St. Matthew. And they said, oh. That was made by a communist. I said, what do you mean? St. Matthew wasn't a communist. He was a tax collector, probably a card-carrying capitalist. I said, no, but the director, the director was Pasolini, who was indeed a communist. The film was dedicated to Pope John XXIII, and he had all students taking the parts of the different characters in the gospel. The only words that were used were taken directly as quotes from the gospel of St. Matthew. But I told the friars, I shared with them, I said, it was a very powerful film, but what disturbed me was the portrayal of the Blessed Virgin Mary. They said, what do you mean? I said, well, she was hysterical on Calvary. She kept crying out and throwing her hands in the air and falling in the ground, and they'd pick her up, and she would scream and cry out again and fall. And the friar said, you don't understand because you're not Italian. If she didn't do that, people would think she didn't love him. But when you read the Gospel of St. John, it says, Mary stood by the cross. She was a pillar of strength in her faith, and she was still saying that yes to God that she said at the Annunciation, be it done unto me according to thy word, because she trusted in God's love and in his power, and that God is going to make everything right. At the cross, we need to have the strength of that faith to be able to stand there and to be able to say yes the way that Jesus did in the garden and the way that Mary does on Calvary. In John's Gospel, Jesus is shown with his strength and his divinity. When they come to arrest him and they said, are you the one? And he says, I am. That phrase in John's Gospel, Jesus uses over and over, and it's to associate him with the description of God in the Old Testament, I am who am, the name of Yahweh, because Jesus is divine. In the scene between, the dialogue between Pilate and, and Jesus, it's almost as if Jesus is the judge of Pilate. And it's Jesus who lays down his life and who takes it up again. Jesus is suffering. Jesus is man, but he is also God. I remember the experience of praying the Stations of the Cross in Jerusalem when I went there with our priests on pilgrimage. And uh, the Stations of the Cross, what they call the Via Dolorosa, winds through the middle of Jerusalem. It goes through the marketplace. And uh, there are crosses on the wall that, that signify the different stations. And I was very touched by seeing the young Arab Christian children, as they would rush down the street, every time they'd go by one of those crosses, they'd reach up 
touch it and then kiss their fingers, almost it was like a mezuzah for them. But what impressed me was there we were, the pilgrims carrying the cross, accompanying Jesus on the Via Dolorosa, but all around us, the hustle and bustle of the city, the buying and the selling, the coming and the going, all took place as if there was nothing important going on, the complete indifference. And I'm sure that when Jesus was being crucified, there was a lot of people, there were a lot of people who were just completely oblivious to what was happening. When we think on Calvary, some of the holiest people in our church, the Blessed Mother, Mary Magdalene, John the Apostle, the holy women are standing there. But right next to them, the soldiers are playing dice. They're gambling. One of the perks of being a soldier at an execution was that you got to keep the prisoners close. Jesus' robe was a seamless gar garment, probably made by Mary. But the soldiers were oblivious to this greatest event in history, and they're only worried about how to divide up the spoils. And yet, finally, when Jesus dies and the earth shakes, one of those soldiers says, truly, this was the Son of God. Certainly one of the most powerful moments in today's gospel is when Jesus gives us his mother, behold thy mother. John the disciple is rewarded for his courage for being on Calvary. Jesus wants us in the church to see ourselves in terms of being a family. Mary is our mother. And everyone else in the church are our brothers and sisters. Jesus wants that to be our most salient feature, our brand, our identification is that we love one another. The Last Supper, Jesus says, this is how people are going to be able to identify you as my disciples, if you love one another. Jesus laid down his life. He loved us first while we were still in sin. And he wants us to love each other the same way. Love one another as I have loved you. The passion story has a surprise ending. The ones who had the courage and the class to ask for Christ's body, to give that sacred body a decent burial, were two Pharisees, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, wealthy, powerful, highly visible, who had a lot to lose for being identified with Jesus. I'm sure that our Lord was very pleased after all, he liked these kinds of surprises. He made the Samaritan the hero in his parable of the Good Samaritan at a time where good and Samaritan were never used in the same sentence. The power of the cross is tremendous. The cross has the power to transform us into a new creation the cross that calls us to conversion and to love. Jesus changed what was a symbol of horror in a public execution, the gallows, the electric chair of his day, into a sign of love, of hope, and of salvation. Today, as we venerate the cross, let us look at that cross the way that the Israelites in the desert, bitten by the snakes, looked at the bronze serpent raised on high so that we too will be healed of the wounds of sin and selfishness. And as we venerate the cross today, let us pray with faith the very words 
of St. Francis of Assisi. We adore Thee, O Christ, and we bless Thee, because by Thy holy cross Thou hast redeemed the world. Amen. Cardinal Sean, putting this holy day in perspective for us as we live in the midst of a health crisis that is our own passion, exposing inconsistency and injustice in our society and providing for us an opportunity to grow through suffering by the power of the cross. We join now in the church's most solemn form of intercession. Let us pray, dearly beloved, for the holy church of God, that our God and Lord be pleased to give her peace, to guard her and unite her throughout the whole world, and grant that leading our life in tranquility and quiet, we may glorify God the Almighty Father. Almighty, ever-living God, who in Christ revealed your glory to all the nations, watch over the works of your mercy, that your church, spread throughout all the world, may persevere with steadfast faith in confessing your name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for our most holy Father, Pope Francis, that our God and Lord, who chose him for the, from the order of bishops, may keep him safe and unharmed for the Lord's holy church to govern the holy people of God. Almighty ever-living God, by whose decree all things are founded, Look with favor on our prayers, and in your kindness protect the Pope chosen for us, that under him the Christian people, governed by you their maker, may grow in merit by reason of their faith through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for our Bishop Sean, for all bishops, priests, and deacons of the church, and for the whole of the faithful people. Almighty, ever-living God, by whose spirit the whole body of the church is sanctified and governed, hear our humble prayer for your ministers, that by the gift of your grace all may serve you faithfully, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for catechumens, that our Lord and God may open wide the ears of their inmost hearts and unlock the gates of his mercy, that having received forgiveness of all their sins through the waters of rebirth, they too may be one with Christ Jesus, our Lord. Almighty, ever-living God, who make your church ever fruitful with new offspring, increase the faith and understanding of our catechumens that reborn in the font of baptism, they may be added to the number of your adopted children through Christ our Lord. Amen. For the unity of Christians, let us pray also for all our brothers and sisters who believe in Christ, that our God and Lord may be pleased, so they live the truth to, get, to gather them together and keep them in his one church. Almighty, ever-living God, who gather what is scattered and keep together what you have gathered, Look kindly on the flock of your Son, that those whom one baptism is consecrated may be joined together by integrity of faith and united in the bond of charity through Christ our Lord. Amen. 
for the Jewish people. Let us pray also for the Jewish people to whom the Lord our God spoke first, that he may grant them to advance in love of his name and in faithfulness to his covenant. Almighty, ever-living God, who bestowed your promises on Abraham and his descendants, graciously hear the prayers of your church that the people you first made your own may attain the fullness of redemption through Christ our Lord. Amen. For those who do not believe in Christ, let us pray also for those who do not believe in Christ, that enlightened by the Holy Spirit, they too may enter on the way of salvation. Almighty, ever-living God, grant that those who do not confess Christ, that by walking before you with sincere hearts, they may find the truth, and that we ourselves being constant in mutual love and striving to understand more fully the mystery of your life, may be more perfect witnesses to your love in the world through Christ our Lord. Amen. For those who do not believe in God, let us pray also for those who do not acknowledge God, that following what is right in sincerity of heart they may find the way to God himself. Almighty, ever-living God, who created all people to seek you always by desiring you and by finding you come to rest, grant, we pray, that despite every harmful obstacle, all may recognize the signs of your fatherly love and the witness of good works done by those who believe in you and so in gladness confess you, the one true God, Father of our human race, through Christ our Lord. Amen. For those in public office, let us pray also for those in public office that our Lord and God may direct their minds and hearts according to his will for the true priest, peace and freedom of all. <laughs> Almighty, ever-living God, in whose hand lies every human heart and the rights of peoples, Look with favor, we pray, on those who govern with authority over us, that throughout the whole world, the prosperity of peoples, the assurance of peace, and the freedom of religion may through your gift be made secure through Christ our Lord. Amen. For those in tribulation, let us pray, dearly beloved, to God the Father Almighty, that he may cleanse the world of all errors, banish disease, drive out hunger, unlock prisons, loosen fetters, granting to travelers safety, to pilgrims return, health to the sick, and salvation to the dying. Almighty, ever-living God, comfort of mourners, strength of all who toil, may the prayers of those who cry out in any tribulation come before you, that all may rejoice because in their hour of need your mercy was at hand, through Christ our Lord. Amen. For those suffering from the current pandemic, let us pray Dearly beloved, to God the Father Almighty, that he may extend his hand in mercy to all those affected by the coronavirus pandemic. Amen. 
Almighty, ever-living God, heal those who are ill, comfort those who mourn, give solace to all who are afraid and alone, and protect those who are providing medical care. Make us instruments of your peace among our brothers and sisters. In your mercy, alleviate our fears and eliminate this scourge so that we may come together again to give you praise and to build your kingdom through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. At this hour, the church beckons us to behold the wood of the cross, ecce lignum crucis, the wood on which hung the Savior of the world. Come, let us adore him. Cardinal Sean and the other ministers of today's Good Friday liturgy will now venerate the cross. This particular crucifix contains one of the great treasures of this cathedral here in Boston, a relic of the true cross, the very wood on which Jesus died. Oh, my people. 
We invite you now in these moments of prayer to venerate the wood of the cross in a virtual way. Behold the wood of the cross on which has hung the salvation of the world. Come, come, let us adore him. The Good Friday Liturgy concludes with a simple communion service. The Holy Eucharist consecrated at last evening's evening Mass of the Lord's Supper is brought to the altar, and those who are present here in the cathedral have the chance to receive the Lord's body and blood. At the Savior's command, and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy 
we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. May the receiving of your body and blood, Lord Jesus Christ, not bring to me judgment and condemnation, but through your loving mercy, be for me protection in mind and body and a healing remedy. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. Corpus Christi, start in me. Although Mass cannot be celebrated today, the Holy Eucharist consecrated last evening is much more than a reminder. It is the very person who died for us on the wood of the cross. This is my body, he said, which will be given up for you. This is my blood, which will be shed for you. Each time we gather at the altar, we stand at the foot of the cross, not as a, a curious people, passing by, but rather as men and women, boys and girls of faith. We proclaim your death, O Lord, and profess your resurrection until you come again.
May abundant blessing, O Lord, we pray, descend upon your people who have honored the death of your Son in the hope of their resurrection. May pardon come, comfort be given, holy faith increase, and everlasting redemption be made secure through Christ our Lord. We have stood in the shadow of the cross of Jesus, in the shadow of his arms, outstretched for us in love. Let the cross cast its shadow over the whole of your life, even on those secret and hidden places we so often shield from its redeeming shade. After having given himself for us, the body of Jesus was placed in the tomb. And so I encourage you, if possible, to enter into the spirit of stillness and prayer that characterizes our waiting for the glory of the resurrection. And we invite you to join us tomorrow evening for the great vigil of Easter, Saturday night, beginning at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Time on YouTube Live, Catholic TV, catholictvlive.com, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Samsung Smart TVs, and Apple TV. On behalf of our staff and the entire Catholic TV family, thank you for joining us. May the Lord who offered his life completely for us come to bless you and all those you hold dear. May he protect you from sickness and all harm. I'm Bishop Reed. Please stay with us here on Catholic TV and when online, visit America's Catholic Television Network at catholictv.com. On this Good Friday, we recall the words from the Gospel of Luke. Jesus spoke from the cross, Father, I entreat